Check, check, check. Check one, two. Check, check, one, two. Testing, one, two, testing, one, two.
Testing, one, two, testing. Hi, everyone. So we're going to get started in about one minute. Um, and if everyone can just, uh, we are testing the- uh, me, ladies and gentlemen. Oh. <laughs> we're going to get started in about one minute. And uh, the clerk's office is also just testing the audio too. So uh, it's, it's loud in here, which is great, but uh, they're going to test the audio and we'll get started with the Environmental Excellence Awards in one minute. Thanks, everyone. Audio test, one, two, audio test. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, Chris, we're online, we're ready, we're rolling, we're good to go. Perfect. Okay. Well, thanks so much for being here. I think yesterday they had the uh, the transit awards in the city hall chambers, but I, we've got, they, I think they had about one third of the people here. We've got maybe three times as many and we're in here, but it's nice because it's a nice full room and I'm glad everyone is here. I know there's overflow room as well in the Honeywell room. So, but uh, glad to see everybody here. My staff was joking that they didn't want to see me in the mayor's chair. And I said, you might be right. You might be right about that. Um, so today at committee, I'm pleased to present the annual environmental excellence awards uh, in recognition of the city employees who have made significant contributions to advance the city's sustainability goals. Welcome to all the nominees who have joined us today for this award presentation. I want to make uh, a special mention and welcome the vice chair, city councillors, our city manager, Wendy Stephenson, uh, senior leaders, uh, the nominators, and a special thanks to uh, Lisa and Lynn, who are the main organizers of the event. Thank you, Lisa and Lynn, for all the work you did today, and thanks everyone for being here. I want to start just by uh, inviting up for the award presentation uh, to, to give some opening remarks, city manager, Wendy Stephenson, to say a few words. Wendy? I'm just gonna pull the mic down a little bit here. <laughs> but thank you much, uh, very much, Chairman Art, and uh, good morning to the members of the Environment and Climate Change Committee. Bonjour à tous, and I just wanna say, wow, I can't believe how many people are in this room today and just say how incredibly proud I am of everyone. Um, I wanna start by welcoming you all, welcoming all of our nominees who have demonstrated exceptional leadership 
and innovation to make our city greener, cleaner, and healthier. There's 15 projects and initiatives that have been nominated this year to showcase staff's creativity, their innovation, expertise, expertise in terms of continuous improvement in our city services in the changing landscape that we're facing. And I say we, we are so proud of these incredible achievements. And it's, it's just absolutely amazing to be here this morning to recognize and celebrate each and every one of you. And I also want to take a moment, I want to acknowledge our general managers who are here uh, and the members of our extended senior leadership team uh, to demonstrate their support of our nominees. So thank you for being here this morning. You know, and as I said, there was an outstanding response to a call for nominations to this year's awards. Hundreds of individuals nominated by their peers. And to me, this shows that there is so much great work that's taking place in our city and city staff's commitment to innovation and continuous improvement. And as everyone knows, the city plays such an important role in protecting our environment and encouraging responsible practices within our community. And our efforts to reduce emissions, protect our tree canopy, respond to the impacts of climate change, and make the best possible decisions regarding our buildings and our assets have been enshrined in our strategic plan. And this is one of our four areas of focus. And we know that we need to lead by example. Il faut prêcher par l'exemple. And the work of our nominees today proves that we're continuing to make great strides to incorporate environmentally sustainable practices to deliver our essential services to our residents each and every day. And because of your leadership and innovation, we as a city have been able to move forward on our environmental protection and sustainability goals. And I think you all should be very proud of your accomplishments. Vous avez être fier de ce que vous avez accompli. The work you're doing shows excellent leadership, not only within our organization, but also within our community. And I'm confident that it inspires others to reduce their impact on the environment. And your work is making a real difference and it's gonna benefit our community, both now and in future generations. So thank you all for your extended commitment and dedication to protecting our environment with that, I'd like to hand it back over to Chairman Art to announce the nominees and the award recipients. Congratulations to all of you. I want to echo Wendy's sentiments about being impressed, not only with the number of nominations, but the quality of work we're recognizing today. Going through the selection panel, being on there, it was very hard to, to pick out um, folks to, you know, to win the award because everyone had done such exemplary work. Um, I also find, found it deeply inspiring to learn more about the great work taking place within our city. I know that others will feel the same. Uh, as an elected official who hears from constituents every day, I can say there's a huge appetite for creative and sustainable ways to manage our public land, our waste, our water, and the building and tr uh, transportation infrastructure that form the bulk of, uh, of our emissions and the change that's coming for us in the future, which we're all seeing now on the ground uh, almost every single year. So on behalf of council and our residents, thank you to all the nominees for your commitment to environmental stewardship and for your leadership and dedication to building a healthier and more resilient, connected and vibrant uh, city. J'ai le plaisir d'avoir l'occasion de vous remercier au nom de la ville et de nos résidents. Today, we're recognizing efforts in two categories. The first category is internal initiatives, which reduce the city's corporate environmental footprint. Uh, the second category is the community category uh, for projects that reduce the overall community footprint. So this year, there are nine nominated projects in the internal category. These nominees are the 2026 residential curbside collection contract. The environmental benefits of this initiative include a reduction in fuel consumption and a potential reduction in greenhouse gas emissions of up to 3,000 metric tons. Uh, the Boys and Girls uh, Redevelopment, which restored an underutilized parcel of land to a healthy and usable condition. The Clark uh, Belanger uh, Stormwater Facility Sediment Cleanout uh, Project, which protected ecological diversity as well as preserving water quality for recreational use. Driving Green, which further uh, furthered more sustainable record keeping and a reduction in GHGs produced by city vehicles. The E-Bus Program, which reduced air pollution, noise pollution, and created a healthier workplace for maintenance staff and mechanics. 
electric vehicles and uh, city fleet vehicles, which normalized the use of electric vehicles for internal city business. The establishment pruning pilot project, which increased the resilience of our tree canopy, more effectively captured carbon and diverted excess stormwater. The LED streetlight conversion project, which reduced light pollution, energy consumption, and GHG emissions and saved a lot of money for the city as well. Transportation master plan part one, which integrates the city's climate vulnerability and risk assessment to realize environmental benefits. But these nine projects represent the highest levels of expertise, professionalism, and teamwork. I invite all the nominees in the internal category who are here today to please stand or give us a wave. And I ask everyone at committee to join me in a round of applause for your exceptional contributions. I'm pleased to announce the winner of this year's Environmental Excellence Award in the internal category is the LED Streetlight Conversion Project. We want to acknowledge the team behind this exceptional project, which has included Chris Brinkman, Barry Forrester, Jeremy Packard, William Quackenbush, Jordan Ross, J.P. Rosan, Greg Sargent, and Isaac Wall. The city of Ottawa is one of the first municipalities to take advantage of a new standard that allowed the city to make use of LED right-of-way lighting and to more quickly and more cost-effectively connect automated controls to monitoring and diagnosis of each fixture. The important green initiative replaced more than 58,000 metal halide fixtures with LED lighting and monitoring technology, providing a more consistent light output prolonged life expectancy and ensure less downtime for each street light. The environmental benefits of this program include reduced light pollution, reduced energy consumption by 66%, and a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 1,261 metric tons per year for an average annual savings of $6 million. Congratulations to the team and thank you for your dedication to this multi-year project. And before I ask the winners to join us for a photo, uh, I'd like to make an honorable mention to Scott Lockhart from the Electric Vehicles and Seat, uh, City Fleet Vehicles Project for his outstanding efforts. Scott was nominated uh, for his leadership in championing the use of electric vehicles, promoting the installation of electric vehicles, charging stations at city facilities, and offering training and logistics support to staff. Uh, that dedication to use the low carbon vehicles has resulted in building code services operating a fleet of 35 hybrid electric cars and uh, uh, hybrid slash electric cars and influence staff behavior outside of work with 100% of BCS staff using fleet electric vehicles confirming that they would look for an electric vehicle for personal use. So thank you as well to, to, to those runner ups. I'd now like to invite the LED streetlight conversion project and the vice chair, uh, if you'll come up vice chair members um, who are here today to please join us for the certificate presentation and photo. In fact, if all any committee members here wanna come up, feel free to come up with us as well for the photo. Come on up. Um, so we'll do a quick photo with the team, the LED streetlight conversion team. Okay, thank you. Okay, there you guys are photo opping too, right? Okay. <laughs> We're gonna do two rows. They gotta go in front. Okay. Go okay. I'm actually one of the tallest women on council, which is really bizarre because I've been short my whole life. Who's taller than you? Stephanie, that's it. Look, it's very strange. Because I'm not this is the worst of the intention of the Whatever. Oh, we gotta we gotta do we gotta do two rows. I guess you're always at the back, right? Okay, thanks so much. Congratulations. Okay, now we're moving on to the community category. Um, the nominees for the community category include the Better Buildings Ottawa Benchmark Program, which mandates building owners of buildings over a certain size to measure and report their performance data on energy use, water use, and GHG emissions. The Expanded Recycling in Parks Program, which led to the diversion of 79% of organic material and 75% of recyclable material from city landfills. The Hydrant Drinking uh, Fountain Pilot Project, which provides 1,500 liters of clean drinking water uh, and diverted 2,500 single-use plastic bottles from landfills. The Public Bike Parking Strategy to make it easier and safer to bike around the city, which reduces the use of fossil fuels and emissions. Rain Ready Ottawa, which has reduced runoff into the Ottawa River, Rotter said, and helped prevent erosion. Um, and updates to the use and care of roads bylaw, which encourages naturalization of public space 
and biodiversity. Um, before we announce this year's winner, I uh, just want to invite all the nominees of that category who are present to please just stand or give us a wave if you can't stand. Thanks very much. Give a round of applause. Thanks so much for your contributions. Um, it's now my pleasure to announce the 2023 Environmental Excellence Award winner in the community category. I just want to make sure. Yes. <laughs> the winner is uh, Rain Ready Ottawa. So congratulations to uh, the team, uh, Sherazad Garabaji, Amanda Lynch, Connor Renouf, um, Julia Robinson, Chris Rogers, Rick uh, Scabaloni, and Barbara St. Uh Rain Ready Ottawa is a pilot pro program that supports property owners in managing stormwater on their property. Early in the pilot, the demand for home assessments outstripped uh, capacity. As a result, the team developed and launched a series of online e-learning modules uh, where residents could learn more about stormwater issues and solutions they could install at their own homes. Rain Ready Ottawa also partnered with Landscape Ontario to offer local companies training in fusion landscape design. This innovative approach to landscape design combines the science of hydrology with the art of horticulture, equipping local businesses with the knowledge and skills to design landscape for clients with on-site stormwater management as a guiding principle. This environmental education project is a great example of multiple partners working together for the benefit of the community. By incentivizing the stormwater management retrofits through rebates, Rain Ready Ottawa is taking a cost-efficient approach to retrofitting Ottawa to be more resilient in the face of increasing rainfall frequencies and amounts, which we're seeing more of every single year. The environmental benefits of this initiative include reducing runoff into the Ottawa River watershed, preventing erosion, maintaining healthy and clean habitats, and helping property owners build resilience while mitigating the effects of climate change. So congratulations to the Rain Ready Ottawa team. I want to make uh, honorable mention. To, it was a tough uh, competition scoring this <laughs> internally, so I do. I want to make honorable mention as well to the Better Buildings Ottawa Benchmark Program team. Uh, you were nominated for supporting owners of large buildings to decrease energy consumption. And the team has provided benchmark reports detailing current energy consumption and invited uh, and invites program participants to workshops with external partners to explore best practices and funding opportunities and the environmental benefits of this program. Um, include an overall uh, reduction in energy consumption um, by program participants and fewer greenhouse gas emissions. And I just want to thank you all for your work as well. Now I invite the Red Rain Ready Ottawa team and again, all members of council and, and the vice chair to please join us for the certificate presentation. Thanks. Well, I also have heels on for once in my life, but I am <laughs> Jessica and Stephanie are me, but I don't think any of the other women are. Okay, I hope that and I'm not that tall, but I thought it Way to go, Connor! <laughs> well, on behalf of my council colleagues, the city manager, and the city leadership team, I just want to say how much we appreciate all the work that all of you have done in this room. Uh, it's more important ever to focus on uh, reducing our environmental footprint and, uh, you know, adapting the city for what's coming our way. Uh, one last thing before we conclude, I would like to invite all the nominees and their nominators and leaders to head down to the Honeywell boardroom just down the hall here to connect with your fellow nominees, grab a cup of coffee, uh, and you can also collect your individual certificates. So thanks so much for being here and enjoy the rest of your day.
Okay, so we're going to get started, and we'll start with the roll call, please, Mr. Clerk. Councillor Brockington. Here. Councillor Brown. Here. Councillor Curry. Here. Councillor Devine. Here. Councillor Hill. Present. Councillor Kavanaugh. Here. Councillor King. Here. Councillor Luloff. Present. Vice Chair Carr. Present. And Chair Menard. Here. You have quorum, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. And uh, Councillor Tierney's office is advised that uh, he's unable to attend today's meeting. Um, so we have our ceremonial presentation. Um, I want to recognize that the meeting is taking place on unceded, unsurrendered Algonquin and Anishinaabe territory today. Um, are there any declarations of interest? Okay, seeing none. Uh, confirmation of minutes. Um, can we confirm the minutes from Tuesday, the 21st of November, 2023? Confirmed. Confirmed. Thank you very much. Uh, response to inquiries. Uh, I understand uh, there is a request to lift at least one of these inquiries. Uh, Councillor Hill, did you want to? Um, yeah, if I can, if I could hold one, uh, 4 .1 and 4 one 4.3, please. Okay, so with the will of committee, can we uh, lift those two inquiries onto today's agenda? Yes. Okay, thanks so much. I understand there might be a, a delegation as well that wants to speak to one of these, so that's timely. Um, we'll consider those inquiries at the at the end of the meeting after the um, the other business on the committee agenda. Uh, the next is the urban flood information report. We've got one speaker for this item and no additional correspondence. Um, there will be a staff presentation, so we'll hold that item. The financial statements for in-house solid waste uh, collection, external audit results. We don't have a staff presentation and received no correspondence, no delegations. Can we uh, carry this item? Carried, thank you. Um, uh, status update, Environment and Climate Change Committee inquiries and motions for the period ending March 8th, 2024. Again, we have no speakers for this item and, and no submissions. Is the report received? Okay, thanks for that. Um, okay, so we'll move back then to the urban flood information report. Um, we've as we've got one speaker for that item, and then we'll start with a staff presentation first. So I'll just invite staff to come up and uh, and provide their presentation before we get to the delegation. Thank you and good morning, Mr. Chair and members of committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share some of the work that infrastructure and water services is doing to address urban flooding. Bonjour, Monsieur le Président et les membres du comité. Je vous remercie de nous avoir accordé l'occasion de vous faire part de quelques-uns des travaux menés par notre département pour lutter contre les inondations urbaines. In October of last year, Council carried a motion by Councillor Carr with regards to the city's response to urban flooding. In those discussions, I identified the need to provide an information report to committee and council to outline the continuous efforts the, that the city is making to mitigate flooding and how all works together to achieve resilience. For infrastructure and water services, urban flooding has been a focus for decades, and today's presentation will show how we have built continuous improvement in everything we do. There is always work that can be done. We are always looking to build flood resilience and mitigate impacts to our residents and business owners. Our top priorities continue to be about protecting the natural environment, public safety, and ensuring sustainable infrastructure. Today with me, I have the Director and Associate Director for Water Linear and Customer Services, all the way to my right, Marilyn Janot and Tyler Hicks, and we, and we also have Haran Sandanayake, the Manager of Water Resources Planning and Engineering. I will now turn it, turn it over to Haran to kick off our presentation. Thank you. Thank you and good morning. <clears throat> uh, next slide, please. What is urban flooding? Urban flooding is one of the two major types of flooding experienced in Ottawa. The second type is riverine flooding, which occurs when a river overflows its banks and may impact homes and infrastructure in the floodplain. Rivers may flood, as we all know, in the spring during melt or during prolonged rain events. 
urban flooding is the subject of today's presentation. Urban flooding occurs in built up urban and rural areas when damage occurs due to water entering buildings. It is a direct result of rainfall and is affected by the intensity and duration of the rain event. It's also affected by topography and the size of storm and sanitary sewer pipes. Climate change, as we know, and a growing number of extreme weather events also significantly impact the city. There are two major types of urban flooding. Overland flooding, where runoff flows over surfaces like streets, yards, and during a significant rainfall event can result in water entering homes through window wells and foundation cracks, et cetera. And there's storm or sanitary flooding that occurs when runoff backs up in basements, often due to sewer system surcharges that occur when the pipe capacity is exceeded. It's important to note that water that accumulates in the street, however, during large rain events is normal. Streets provide storage capacity for rainfall that is then able to slowly enter into the stormwater collection system and help prevent potential backups into homes. Next slide, please. The system cre uh, created to manage runoff and drainage has many components that are all integrated. All of the components, topography, geography, private property infrastructure, and municipal infrastructure are connected together. They work together during rainfall events. This means that none of these components are sufficient on their own. However, none can be ignored either. They all play their part and contribute to flood resilience. The City of Ottawa staff have been, are now, and continue to be committed to the continual improvement of the municipal components of the system. Next slide, please. Just as the drainage system is a connected system with many parts, so too is the toolkit of strategies that the City of Ottawa employs to build and increase flood resilience. The six items on this slide work together to create flood resilience. Just like the components of the drainage system, each tool in the toolkit has a specific role. And this means, again, that none of these tools are sufficient on their own. However, none can be ignored either. They all play their part and contribute to flood resilience. And once again, the City of Ottawa staff have been, are now, and will continue to be committed to the continual improvement of all of these tools in the toolkit. The following slides describe these tools in more detail. Uh, next slide, please. The first tool is planning and strategy. There are many aspects of planning for and strategizing improvements to flood resilience. Plans and strategies are required because of several factors such as growth and affordable housing, financial planning, climate change, renewal of infrastructure at the end of its life, and other opportunities to improve the system for flood resilience. It is important that planning not be completed in a piecemeal fashion. Rather, the City of Ottawa uses both a, le uh, sorry, a systems level view and a long-term view in these plans and strategies to inform how best to use the other tools in the toolkit. Next slide, please. Community design is the next tool. It uh, creates those elements of the drainage system that cannot easily be changed or easily improved in the future. Neighborhoods and their systems are designed and built to the standards of the day. For decades, the city has been finding ways to build resilience in communities of various ages with large scale infrastructure renewal, local infrastructure improvements, and support for private property protection measures. During, uh, depending on the age of your neighborhood, it may have been built before modern principles of surface runoff management were the standard of the day. In these neighborhoods, the key design focus was the size of the sewer or the ditch. Newer neighborhoods starting sometime in the 1990s do consider surface runoff management. We now plan for home elevations, driveway elevations, road widths, road slopes, surface flow paths to manage runoff in extreme events. In addition, of course, to the traditional sewer sizing and ditch sizing. It's important to note that there is no stormwater system that will have capacity for every extreme event, which leads us to the next tool in the toolkit. Um, next slide, please. Risk assessment and mitigation programming. The City of Ottawa already uses a sophisticated suite of tools and techniques to identify and quantify risks. Risk assessment is a critical component that enables the design and implementation of mitigation measures. Effective flood mitigation measures do not only include the ones I mentioned, local 
infrastructure improvements, large scale programs like Glencairn or infrastructure projects uh, like Sandy Hill Storage Tank. It also includes very effective, low cost and quick to implement solutions such as backwater valves in homes or inlet control devices in our catch bases. These measures are very important as well, and they work together with the larger measures for a wide range of rainfall events, which means they're effective in a wide range of rainfall events. Um, I'll now turn the presentation over to Tyler, who will describe the remaining tools in the Flood Resilience Toolkit. Thank you. Thank you, Ren. Uh, next slide, please. The proper function of our city's sanitary and stormwater system relies on extensive operations and maintenance program. Our comprehensive preventive maintenance measures include regular inspections of all sanitary combined and storm sewers. Additionally, a proactive cleaning of sewers, catch basins, and hotspot cleaning saw over 2,000 work orders completed last year. Furthermore, our ongoing sewer repair program addresses identified issues promptly with nearly 5,000 repair locations tended to in 2023. Our team also operates, monitors, and cleans over 100 stormwater management locations to ensure that water is a place to drain without adversely affecting the environment. With dedicated teams available at all times, we swiftly respond to problems and provide support for our residents. Next slide, please. Most of what we've been talking about today are the actions that the city is taking to prevent flooding but it's important to note that residents can take actions to help ensure their property can withstand extreme rainfall events. There are simple and more complex actions that residents can take. For those more complex actions, the city has programs available to support residents. The Residential Protective Plumbing Program provides financial assistance for the installation of sump pumps and backwater valves, which prevents water from entering basements when sewers are surcharged. We are working on making improvements to this program by streamlining the application process and raising awareness of the program to ensure that the residents who can most benefit are able to take advantage of this program. The Rain Ready program helps property owners find better ways to manage rainfall on their property. While this program is not specifically geared to preventing flooding, improving drainage on private property does help move water away from homes and helps the system as a whole. Some of the simple actions that residents can take when to get ready for rain include regularly cleaning out ease troughs, keeping culverts clear, cleaning out backwater valves, and testing sump pumps. The city also supports residents that are affected by frequent flooding. Eligible property owners can apply for their support through the Compassionate Grant Program. This program was introduced in 2009 but is now rarely used. Ma major changes are being considered and recommendations will be brought for committee later this year. Next slide, please. We recognize how difficult an extreme rainfall event can be for the people affected. When rainfall exceeds the limits of the stormwater system, there's little that the city can do to stop the flow of water into properties, but we can learn from flooding events. Currently, we gather data, conduct thorough analysis and review of the information collected, identify root causes of flooding, and conduct detailed investigations to develop solutions to address the causes of flooding. With this information, we can make improvements that can increase the resiliency of local systems. Using the information gathered from the August 10th, 2023 extreme rainfall event, we will be implementing small, small local improvements while conducting more detailed investigations to identify further short and long-term solutions. We are also making improvements to how we support residents who are affected by flooding by providing timely information on what steps they can take after a flood. We are developing communication tools to help support residents before, during, and after rainfall events. This will include improving the flood reporting process, including by allowing residents to report flooding using tools on the city's website. Next slide, please. Using the previously mentioned plans, studies, risk assessments, and information from real life events, we develop projects large and small to continually improve drainage in Ottawa. The focus is doing the right thing at the right time for the right cost. Over the last four decades, Council has invested $340 million on large projects such as the Sandy Hill Storage Tank, Combined Sewage Storage Tunnel, West End Flood Mitigation, Orleans Flood Mitigation, and Preston Street Combined Sewer Upgrades. Smaller local improvements have also been undertaken to separate combined sewer systems, increase pipe sizing, upgrade catch basins, and add inlet control devices. 
Many of these improvements are conducted in tandem with integrated road renewal projects, since this is the most cost-effective time to make these upgrades. Next slide, please. As you can see, urban flooding has many complexities, which city staff are continuously working on to better understand and mitigate. The city has built a toolkit with a suite of tools to increase flood resilience in neighborhoods. With differing ages and with different challenges, the city is committed to continue our efforts to make improvements and investments to city infrastructure. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for that presentation. We do have one delegation um, and it is Erica Shardlow with the uh, with Cafes. Erica, if you can come up if you're here or online. Hi. Can Hi, Erica. Me? We can hear you and you've got five minutes and your PowerPoint is ready to go. Okay, wonderful. Um, well, first off, uh, thank you everyone for the opportunity to speak this morning. Uh, my name is Erica Charlot, and I'm a program coordinator at Cafes Ottawa, and I'll be speaking for a few minutes on urban flooding. Uh, next slide, please. So about CAFES, CAFES stands for Community Associations for Environmental Sustainability. We were founded in 2010 and we are a network of local environmental leaders that includes over 200 representatives from urban, suburban and rural areas. Next slide. Uh, so this is just a quick overview of the presentation. So we can go to the next slide, please. So I want to start off by saying that it is really good to see that the city's urban flood information report clearly acknowledges climate change and that by the 2050s, we can expect that wet days will be wetter with a 15% increase in the precipitation that falls in one day, um, an 8% increase in the total precipitation um, or freezing rain with the top risks being flooding and flooding damage. Uh, next slide. So urban flooding is the leading cause of preventable damage to homes with costly basement flooding, often a result. Uh, so plans to manage extreme rainfall should ideally include actions from municipal infrastructure, but also integrate city incentives with insurance practices and involve property owners. Next slide. So in 2023, CAFES explored community resilience through our climate dialogues. And from these, we know that residents are concerned. Uh, people are expecting new infrastructure, uh, new building codes, new development standards. And currently resilience is quite low. Uh, communities are typically not prepared or informed. And we're finding people need more clarity on who is responsible and who pays for these flooding investments. Next slide. So uh, we have been listening and learning a lot from residents at the coffee houses on sustainability dialogues that have been happening in the Glebe. So on June 8th, the theme will be on basement flooding and everyone is invited to come out to these dialogues. They're really great. Uh, just bring your own coffee cup. Next slide. So CAFES has also partnered with the Institute for Catastrophic Loss Reduction, uh, and we also plan to chat with the Insurance Bureau of Canada on March 27th at our public keynote event. Uh, next slide. So from these things, we have found that there does need to, there needs to be better and more public information available. Like I was saying, people generally don't know what kind of supports exist, uh, like for example, backwater valve grants. Um, so would detailed hazard mapping and historical flooding information help to prepare for flooding risks? Um, hazard mapping for residential areas is typically not available to the public or homeowners. So should this be part of a resiliency checklist uh, or a residential resiliency rating? Uh, we need to connect housing affordability to climate resilience and consider what is happening with costs of home insurance coverage. Like, can we connect the protective plumbing program incentives to insurance offerings? Next slide. So in terms of what other cities are doing, uh, 30 municipalities are providing basement flooding prevention subsidies. So a review of Ottawa's protective plumbing program is definitely timely. Uh, and we believe residents should be consulted, which is something that cafes can help with. Next slide. So many green engineered investments like tree trenches are being installed uh, by cities like Vancouver and Toronto for stormwater management. 
Uh, tree trenches reduce the burden on drain pipes and research shows they are really effective even during major rain events. And we think this would be a great cost-effective opportunity that also enhances livability. Next slide. So our recommendations are to consult with the community and match best practice in the revamp of the protective plumbing program. Uh, green on-site stormwater absorption is definitely needed and cheaper than gray infrastructure capital projects, and we need to find a source of funds for this. And lastly, we need more work and analysis on community incentives, especially how to engage the insurance sector to make that link between homeowner investments and lower rates and higher coverage. Um, so if you go to the next slide, that concludes our presentation. And uh, thank you very much for your time and the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation, Erica. I'm not seeing questions, but I just wanted to say thank you so much for all the work that CAFES is doing with those coffee houses and educating people and partnering where possible with the city um, to educate and also uh, ensure that residents uh, have access to the resources that the city does have, but may not may not know about them. So uh, really appreciate your presentation today. It helps us um, with the you know urban and, and rural flooding. Um, and, uh, hopefully we can connect soon on some of those coffee houses. You said that next one was June 8th. Is that, is that what it, where it was? Uh, yes, actually the next one is coming this Sunday and, uh, the focus will be on green space and trees, but yes, the June 8th will be on basement flooding. Fantastic. And, and it's an Alta Vista, a good place to, to have it given, um, the urban flooding that, that ha has happened there. So thanks very much uh, for being here again. Okay, so we're going to move now to questions from committee members for staff and Vice Chair Carr is up first. Hi, th hi. thanks very much for the report. Thank, um, thank you for the update. I know I've been working closely with uh, staff since August 10th when we had record rainfall uh, come into the community um, and uh, the need to revisit our programs, program delivery and communication to residents was evident after that. Uh, to me, as a, a first-time councillor dealing with uh, massive flooding in the area of 486 reported floods across the city, 180 of them are roughly 38% uh, were recorded in my ward. Um, I found that there was a lot of um, confusion about roles with the homeowner. What is the city's responsibility? What is the private homeowner's responsibility? And because uh, our sewer system was built to the standard of the time, um, there was a lot of education that, that is needed Amongst um, residents, uh, I could really see the devastating impacts in the community with respect to uh, people who lost a lot of their belongings, people who have lost their insurance because of repeated floods um, and no longer qualify for insurance. There was a significant loss of, of housing um, in one area. It's an area where a lot of people had basement apartments and uh, we lost a lot of housing and in some cases affordable housing. So the, the implications are severe. And uh, I appreciate uh, the attention that uh, the teams have paid to this uh, and have uh, showed me some of the new, Tyler recently showed me one of the new communication tools that has just been released. And uh, I have been getting updated regularly. Just a few questions. Um, you know, one of the big things was that, uh, you know, the Residential Protective Plumbing Program and the Compassionate Grant Program, we talked about this, are sort of insufficient with their, you know, they're burdensome and insufficient. Um, you mentioned that there would be updates being made to the program. Can you walk me through a little bit on how uh, community engagement will happen on those programs? Will they be released as a report to council and then just have, you know, the, t the statutory timeframes to come and make a delegation? Or will this be proposals that are done through Engage Ottawa, if we can talk a little bit about how that community engagement on those changes will happen. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, Mr. Chair, we haven't uh, finalized our communication strategy for the Protective Plumbing Program. One of the difficulties we, we run into with this program is it's hard to get feedback when there's a lack of awareness. So we feel there's a need to raise awareness and we have out, re reached out to some of the customers that have used it. And certainly the message that we've received already is that it needs to be simplified, it needs to be streamlined, and it needs to be more readily available. And we're really hope hoping to focus on awareness and uh, raising that awareness to get the feedback on what the right tools are for residents to be able to use, and really making sure that residents are aware of what the most appropriate measures for their own individual situation is. Because as, as we discussed today, the causes of flooding can be complex. And although in a community, it might be relatively similar that uh, protective measures in one area might, might work in that area, it might not match as much in a, in a different location in the city. 
Yeah, perfect. And I, I certainly think we clearly saw the geographical dis, uh, differences across wards, uh, across the a city that's 2,800 square feet where uh, there needs to be uh, attention paid in, in certain areas. Um, one of the programs that exists, and I don't know if anyone on the panel here is here to speak to it, but Rain Ready Ottawa, most of my ward has not been eligible for that program um, to date, and yet I have the most flooding. Is anyone here to be able to speak about changes that are coming to Rain Ready Ottawa? I don't see Connor, but uh, someone else. Because I think that's a really important program if we have something in place and then one of the areas most impacted hasn't been eligible. Thank you, Councillor, for the question. So um, Rain Ready Ottawa is going through, the program is going through review right now. Uh, we've, we're ending the pilot phase. Um, and so we're expecting a report to come forward to committee and council in April is the, uh, the plan date or shortly thereafter. And that review uh, looks at, examines the effectiveness of the program. It also looks at a question of whether and how uh, staff recommend expanding, what the options are for expanding the reach of the program to align very specifically with the goals of the program, which is uh, specifically looking at impacts on local water courses. So that report is expected to be coming um, uh, in the next couple of months. And as part of that, we did do extensive engagement, both in terms of participants uh, who have been part of the program, but also a public engagement. Thanks very much. And I look forward to that and as well um, seeing the uh, revised uh, residential protective program, plumbing program, and the compassionate grant program and anything else. I'll just, uh, I'll turn it over to someone else to ask questions, Chair, but I've, from my vantage point, uh, as the, the counselor for Ultivist Award that had a, a record of, um, amount of floods in the city, I think uh, investments that we need to make in climate resiliency are absolutely critical. Uh, in 2016, 17, we also had what was called a 100-year flood that had very damaging impacts uh, on my neighborhood. And uh, six years later, we had another 100-year flood. Uh, climate change is here, and uh, we can see it in, in the extreme weather events. And uh, I appreciate all the attention staff have paid to this issue. Thanks, Vice Chair Carr, and thanks for your leadership on uh, the motions you've passed. And I'm looking forward to that report back. And there's lots of questions from committee members still. Uh, Councillor Hill. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, this will reinforce, I think, what Councillor uh, uh, Councillor Carr was speaking to in terms of our concerns about uh, the future trend line on urban flooding and such. Um, just a couple questions. Mostly of them are, are actually asking about how we're looking at making investments that can, uh, I think, can perhaps have some positive impact. Uh, I heard at a previous environment committee meeting where we were talking on a similar topic about uh, about leveraging parks as drainage sites, and I just wanted to ask: Is that part of our? Uh, integrated strategy whereby we're trying to, you know, establish new parks and park systems that are, you know, below the waterline or what have you, or places where uh, they can act as a, as a, like a temporary flood control measure or a stormwater sewer type uh, in extremist uh, uh, containing system. Thank you, Chair. Uh, generally speaking, no uh, parks and drainage. We're we're trying to keep the the parks dry that doesn't mean that in specific instances that it hasn't been considered we've had discussions with developers on precisely that the issue uh from a purely a water resources perspective on on the on how drainage can be impacted by parks is the park has to be in the right place to have a benefit so just one example uh near where i live uh, grasshopper hill park it's a hill, it's the beginning of the drainage area, doing a, and it has a lot of pervious area, doing a lot of improvement in that park is not going to have any significant impact on the flooding that's experienced downstream. But parks in other places that are in the right location can have a big impact. And these are the sorts of things that we would look at. In uh, After August 10th flooding, we are, have looked at the areas that have flooded and where there are parks, we are looking at what can be done uh, in 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 the sort of vein that you you mentioned, you know, are there are there things that could be done that could help uh, drainage uh, within and outside the park? No, thanks for that. Um, we heard from the delegation 
previously about the idea of tree trenches. Is that something that the city's looking at? I uh, thank you, Chair. I'm not entirely sure uh, the extent to uh, to which we're looking at that. I could I could come back to you with that answer. I I will just say that uh, tree trenches, just like many other stormwater management techniques, are are generally on the table. We have to just like uh, what which was said before. It has to align with the goal, and if uh, and and. Tree trenches, just like many other technologies, don't only have a drainage impact. They could have many other benefits as well. But I, I don't know to the, uh, right now to the extent that uh, that it's integrated into our right away management. I just program. mentioned too before, Councillor Hill, handing it back to you. There, are, there are some pilot projects going on uh, with tree trench like technology to gather that storm water to both feed that tree and to take it off the the roadway um, in in some areas. So I know city staff have started uh, that work, and some pilots are underway now. Hopefully, we'll see that more and more on our on our main streets as an example. Back to you. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, similarly, I know that there, there are some advances in technology in terms of aggregates and hard surfaces. Is this something that we're investigating in terms of vulnerable locations or areas like uh, parking lots that are in low, low lying areas whereby, um, you know, some of those hard surfaces, instead of pushing all of that water to the outsides, that it can actually absorb some of that water as well? Uh, thank you, Chair. I am aware of certain cases where that's exactly what we're doing, where uh, city owns facilities like community centers. Uh, and when they come up for renewal, we are looking at innovative stormwater management techniques in those sites. In, in addition, I, I, I'm not sure if, if the question was specifically for city facilities, but we're working on low impact development guidelines. I know the province is, is going to be, uh, sounds like they're going to be coming up with uh, with the provincial guidelines as well. So there's a lot of movement in, in this space for sure. No, thank you very much. Okay, thanks for those questions, Councillor Hill. Uh, Councillor Curry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is perfect timing. So I was just about to say, uh, it's great that so much of this presentation was on reactive things. We have to do that, you know, because so much of our city is already built. But in terms of being proactive, I'm just wondering how much staff are giving feedback to, and so everyone, if you're not aware of this, that uh, MPP Karen McCrimmon has put forward Bill 168 in the legislature, on, uh, and it's called the Storm Water Flood Prevention Act of 2024. And um, it's looking at upgrading and, and uh, renewing the standards that had been looked at about 15 or, well, I don't know how many years ago, but provincial for uh, former provincial government looked at upgrading the standards for low impact development. And then since then, nothing has happened. So the bill is making its way through the legislature. And I just want to ask staff, are they giving feedback to that uh, bill? Uh, thank you, Chair. That that was actually the provincial uh, document that I was referring to. Um, this is a document that, as as has been mentioned, has been in the works for quite a while, and we were actively engaged in that process in the development of the guidelines in responding to uh, the province's consultant and and working with a, a large range of municipal stakeholders. Um, with that information, even though the guidelines have not been technically released, we we have that information that's informed our development of our own guidelines as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just for clarification, what I understand from the engineers, uh, you know, in Canada, we're always talking about stormwater. Um, the engineers tell me that what we do is we add on 20% to a 100-year flood. Um, is that what you're talking about? We do because what this bill, Bill 168, is going to do is upgrade the standards so that, and I don't know that it would be exactly just 20% in addition to 100-year numbers. Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and my apologies. I, I should have been clearer. Uh, when I refer to our guidelines, I was referring to our upcoming gu guidelines on low-impact development, so they're not complete yet. As, with regards to the 20%, there's a, a few aspects here. We are looking at our design guidelines for elements of the stormwater management system where where we where we're, we wouldn't necessarily apply 20%. The 20% is a stress test. So we look at 100 year plus 20% to see if uh, when the developer is designing a, a new neighborhood, whether 
there is water coming into the building. Um, and we will be uh, reviewing that as well, but it's not quite the same as saying we're adding 20% to, let's say, the size of all infrastructure. It's a stress test approach, which, which may not sound the same, but it's actually uh, more robust because we're looking at the whole system. It, uh, what I mentioned in the presentation is we have a systems view when designing new communities, and, and this is the aspect of systems view. So it's the 20% is is um, it sounds like we're just adding 20%, but it's actually a stress test for an extreme event and seeing how the whole system behaves. With, with that said, we are uh, reviewing our guidelines uh, uh, su subsequent to any recommendations coming out of the climate resiliency strategy. Okay, and you will be following this Bill 168 as it makes its way through the legislature. Thank you, Chair, yes. Wonderful, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. We'll go to Councillor Kavanaugh for questions next. Thank you, Vice Chair. Um, and thank you for the report. Uh, flooding is top of mind in Bay Ward after uh, incidents of the past, but this is urban flooding, and I realize the distinction. Um, and it's also top of mind. Um, it, it's uh, it's an area where there's a lot of intensification happening um, due to the LRT coming in, uh, stage two. And um, it's a weird mix of old style uh, housing um, and neighborhoods which had ditches um, and yet we're going to have intensification in those areas um, and the ditches have been kind of neglected for a long time and, uh, and I think they're they are an important part of the system for urban flooding and are we going to uh, be proactive of um, uh, bringing them back to to life because um, it's been something that has been forgotten and I know we're going to have a subcommittee on ditches very exciting <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I just want to talk about ditches because um, it is a concern um, and um, it's right in the areas that are being targeted for intensification such as Wood Park and, and Queens Bay Terrace North for example the other concern is loss of housing or sorry loss of trees pardon me um, because um, trees obviously hold water. And as we intensify, we will see tree loss. We have seen tree loss. And that's the first thing people notice is when um, there's um, infill um, and there's tree loss, um, they see concerns about flooding. And I just want to know about the balancing act of, of um, making sure we have those tree canopies to help uh, with uh, preventing flooding. Uh, thank you, Chair. I could speak to uh, perhaps the first two uh, points. Uh, one was about a mention of intensification. Uh, as may be already known, uh, the infrastructure master plan is coming forward this year, and two specific programs were designed brand new to deal with stormwater management, flooding, and intensification. So that will be coming later this year. With regards to ditches, uh, the statement in, in my estimation is absolutely correct. Ditches are an important part of the stormwater drainage system. They are uh, I infrastructure just like storm sewers. They often have, at well, they have the same level of service, but often actually a better level of service than, than uh, sewers when they are in good condition. And just like storm sewers, uh, they have a life cycle and they need to be restored. In, in the case of storm sewers, it's replaced, but in the case of ditches, restored at the end of their life. And and yes, th there are programs to review uh, all right-of-ways for at the end of their life cycle. We are working on a number of neighborhoods right now. Thank you. I appreciate it because as we go through secondary plans, for example, we're doing one on Lincoln Fields, and the one of the issues that's used as well, we can't do intensification because of of urban flooding. Um, we do need more information um, available for for residents on how we're tackling that because we can't. They're asking these questions, and we have to show it's not an afterthought. It's something that has been planned in, because it's a very uh, concerning issue, um, uh, because it's it's part of the reason that uh, we need to. Um, have an overall system, and I appreciate it will probably be in the in the infrastructure report. But um, just letting you know that that's top of mind right now. And in terms of uh, tree loss, um, uh, trees are not mentioned a lot in here. But uh, how are we tackling? How are we tackling that? And I see a person who can answer that. <laughs> Uh, 
<laughs> Thanks, Martha. Sorry to make you come all the way down. Thank you so much um, through you, Chair. Thanks for the question. Um, well, as you know, we have our urban forest management plan that we're actively implementing. And uh, the big focus for this term of council is our tree planting strategy for the city. And so what we're gonna be doing through that is looking at what we um, are doing for tree planting right now, what tree planting programs we have, and where um, basically looking at our canopy cover data and understanding where trees are really needed the most, where we're missing, where the plantable space is, where we're missing canopy cover, so our low canopy cover areas, and um, looking at creating new programming, expanding our programming to address to ensure that we're getting trees planted in the areas that are needed the most. And so these are the kinds of things that we'll be thinking about through um, that analysis. We're working quite closely with Haran's group um, on several items related to on-site stormwater management and that kind of thing and understanding the um, impact on trees. And um, we're planning to basically launch the tree planting strategy quite soon. And we're hoping to have some early action items coming back to this committee. Um, with respect to new tree planting programs this year, so. That's helpful. Um, and I hope we're gonna to continue to have a hard line on retaining older trees, not just tree planting. Um, we started that with the tree bylaw and we've seen some success, but I, I still am concerned about that with intensification infill. Yeah, so we're, um... We obviously are still implementing the tree bylaw and we feel that it's going quite well. I mean, we're probably, I think we're about three years into the new tree bylaw now. And as you know, we were focused on um, the protection of existing trees during infill development. And we've been able to basically integrate our forestry and planning forestry staff into the earliest stages of development at all levels. So from building permits to committee of adjustment through other developments as well. And I mean, you know, to be clear, there is a conflict between development and trees, and we're not always going to be able to save all trees on all sites, but we are definitely seeing um, an uptick in being able to have a lot more retention and protection over time than we were before the new tree bylaw came into effect because of that early consideration of trees. Thank you. And I know it's important because it takes, you know, 100 years for that tree to get that big. Um, and tree planting is great, but uh, it's trying to find ways to protect those older trees in these areas. Oh, I appreciate it. Um, thank you. Um, I'll just have one more question, and that is about uh, funding. Um, I worry about if there's a backlog of uh, funding needed for the infrastructure crowd. And I guess we're going to hear about that later, but um, I'm, I'm concerned that, um, you know, that it's piling up because it's getting more expensive to do infrastructure um, and and to do updating of our system. It's not very sexy. It's something we see. It's underground. We don't see it, but it's really, really necessary. And um, and how are we doing in terms of funding for these projects? Uh, thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Um, as uh, some members of the committee may be aware, there are provincial regulations around asset management plans that are required for all different asset classes, including stormwater, water, wastewater, transportation. And so in 2025 is when we bring the asset management reports, which also includes not only a 10-year projection, but also an understanding of to what level of service, to what level of condition do we want to maintain the assets and the level of investments that we would be required for that. So that, that will be, I think, a critical discussion for committee and council in, in 2025. And so this is where all of this will, will come together. So it'll be a holistic view of all of the assets uh, that are paid for either by rate uh, by rate funding or, or tax funding. And then uh, we can have uh, that wholesome kind of discussion and, and decision on what it is uh, that's important and where to prioritize uh, the funding. Okay, hey, thank you. Thanks very much, Councillor Kavanaugh. Councillor Devine. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you for the presentation. I'm 
As with uh, my colleagues, I'm certainly uh, very enthused to have this critical conversation and to continue having this critical conversation. Um, it was interesting that today's presentation started with a quote from the city manager, and I'm paraphrasing um, her quote, but something to the effect of, as everyone knows, the city plays such a huge role in helping us meet um, our climate goals. And with that acknowledgement comes a certain level of responsibility. Um, and I also appreciate, speaking of responsibility, that the delegation from CAFES made reference to the climate change master plan, where the city continuously um, and legitimately is repeating the statement that we can and should expect an increase of, of these high level floods. And with that acknowledgement, I think we are communicating not just the responsibility on residents, but we're communicating our responsibility as a city as well. If we are saying to our residents, you should expect calamity and disaster year after year, to a certain extent, we have to show how we are living up to that acknowledgement. Um, and of course, that always comes, I look forward to in our budgets. Um, I also find it every time I hear the term 100 year flood, 100 year flood, we're kidding ourselves with the term 100 year flood. We should revive, take a zero off that. Um, it's a one in 10 year flood, a one in five year flood. So the more we keep on thinking that, you know, climate change calamity is way off in the future, we're just, we are ostriches with, with our heads in the sand. And I think we have to change everything about the way we budget to recognize that. We talk about budgeting, you know, as if it's a household budget. And certainly in a household budget, you speak to, like I tell my kids every day, no, you can't have that. That's a nice to have. That's a want. We only have limited money. We can only fund our needs. Based on the reports I hear from my residents about devastating impact, not only to their property, but to their, to their quality of life, I am hearing of devastation. Um, that these must be seen as needs and our budget needs to reflect these being seen as needs. There's a, um, a city administrator in Manitoba that I met who continuously makes an impression on me where he says quite clearly, every single dollar spent on infrastructure can and must be seen as a dollar spent on building climate resilience. Every single dollar we spend. And that's not only on infrastructure, that's on something as simple as public works street maintenance. It's great that we can tell our residents, please be sure to clear your catch basin, go out there and clear your catch basin. But if we can double or triple the amount of times that we send our trucks around to clean up debris, that might have a similar impact. I can't tell you on August 10th, how many times I saw residents up to their knees raking away leaves. I'm grateful they did it, but if we'd only had the budget to send out a, sweet, uh, a street sweeping truck, maybe once a week before, we may not have had that calamity. Um, so speaking of calamity, I share my, my colleague, Councillor Carr's concerns um, that her ward certainly was one of the hardest hit in the August 10th flood, my ward as well. Um, ward 9, again, for reasons um, yet to be clearly known, um, probably because it's an older established ward with infrastructure that certainly can bear some upgrades and maintenance. Whether it's hit by wind or hit by water, we're, we're sorely hit. I very much appreciated the report we got from Eric Toussignan detailing the impact across the city. And then he zeroed in on Ward 9 and he told me the areas that were hit. Um, and I noticed in that report, he identified pockets of Ward 9 that were quite hit. And based on our own preliminary investigation post August 10th, I said, oh, it seems to be missing a few areas there. So we quickly launched a Google survey to our residents. We put it out a week or a month or so ago, within a day of putting it out, we got 50, 60 responses right away, clearly identifying patterns of, of you know, flooding uh, disaster. And we were, we were clear to ask, was your flooding only on August 10th or do you have patterns of flooding? Because we wanted to see what kind of patterns are emerging. And certainly there are patterns emerging. And I'm leading to a question, pardon my, my long-winded rant here. But those patterns indicated clear addresses. We asked for postal codes and you put them up on a map and boom, there's a nice little red spot there. And so my first question, when it comes to the programs we have, whether it's the residential protective, I forget the term, the, the residential 
you know what it is. The Residential Protective Plumbing Program or the Compassionate Grant Program or the Rain Ready Ottawa Program. Do we have the capacity, because I think that we should be increasing our educational, promotional, and incentivization campaigns for that, but these are not necessarily universally required programs. There are areas of the city that are hit harder than others. So do we have the capacity, whether through our social media advertising or other forms, of zeroing in on which residents should be getting this Facebook message far more often than others? So that's my first question. Do we do geographically targeted advertising for these preventative measures based on our own data and mine? I can share my Google link of where the hotspots are. Yeah, thank you for the question, uh, Chair. The the short answer is not yet. And I think it is absolutely critical that we focus on those residents that can most benefit from the programs and that we um, may raise awareness and raise marketing of the programs that we have to the to the people that can most benefit from it. That is certainly within our plans. We're happy, happy to work with you and, and I'd be very interested to hear the information that you have gathered so far to make sure that we can really reach the residents that can most benefit from these programs. And that is something we're committed to doing within our updates of the program. And I will certainly um, share my info with you. Can I just ask a follow-up to that question? When you're saying not yet, does that mean not yet we have means of um, doing targeted advertising campaign for these programs or not yet the city does not yet have the capacity for doing targeted advertising? Like my election campaign, anybody can do targeted Facebook advertising, you know, oh, you, you like plums over here. There's that ad. You like plums, what the heck? We Anybody, my, my kid can do targeted Facebook ads. So do we have the capacity as the city to do targeted advertising campaigns based on need? Um, yes, thank you for the question. Um, we will work closely with our communications group to ensure that we can we can make those tar tar targeted and focused advertisements. We've also heard from other residents that not you know social media is a great way to to advertise, but it's not necessarily the only means and and not a, a, the only way that uh, people are receiving this message. So we're we're working to get to all residents in whatever ways we can, and really focusing on the areas that can most benefit from the programs. Councillor Devine, your uh, your time is up. Uh, I'll get back on after. Get back on. That'd Thank you. Great. There's only two other members that want to speak, so you, I imagine you'll be on very soon. I need time to catch my breath, anyway. So okay. Sure. Thank you very much. Good questions. And uh, Councillor Brockington, you're up next. Thanks, Chair, and thanks to staff for this um, the follow up report today. It's appreciated. Um, uh, as many people know, River Ward had their share of of impacts on August 10th as well, and. Um, it's quite uh, distressing to have seen the impact on so many residents across the ward. Um, one issue that uh, I have raised with staff already is just how people report flooding. So I know in Alta Vista, I think there was a, a piloted survey or a, a targeted survey that people uh, could fill out and um, provide details to staff, which I think was was very good at getting information. But even after the River Ward specific report was issued just a few months ago, and people received that report, they said, I've never reported. I have not yet reported to the city. So I do think that um, the impact within my own ward was underreported, but I do think staff has a good handle on where uh, the flooding incidents occurred and where infrastructure needs to be looked at. There are a number of residents who have reported to me that their insurance coverage was light in the grand scheme of things, meaning they're stuck with a bill of fifty, sixty thousand dollars to remediate their basements in particular, that their insurance is contributing just a fraction of the total cost. And so I'm wondering if, to staff, if there's an opportunity here to uh, share our thoughts on the types of coverage homeowners should be acquiring, whether they need additional coverage, like how do people protect themselves so that they don't get stuck with a $50,000 bill at the end of the day? They're widows who literally don't have the money to do this, whose homes today are still in disrepair and they don't know what to do because they don't have the money. So I, I just want to park that with staff because I think if we can communicate uh, about the importance of insurance, the importance of flood insurance, 
um, and whether there's additional insurance or more insurance people can take on to mitigate that risk, I think that would be appreciated. Um, and I do think staff are well aware of, of how we can better inform residents. What can they do to prep their own homes and properties to mitigate water infiltration or penetration? And, and there's some recently uh, created uh bulletins or or displays that I think help address that. So I think that's good as well. So I do have a question, but first I want to talk about street sweeping. So we street sweep once a year. We sweep the streets in the spring. We used to sweep the streets in the autumn as well. And I can tell you from walking on the streets in the autumn, all the election campaigns I've done, there is a significant amount of debris on our streets in the autumn that doesn't get collected leaves in particular so if we have an early snow and people haven't amassed those leaves you can see it in the streets now that contributes to those storm drains being clogged and so it'd be interesting if staff could get back to us just with a quote how much does it cost to sweep streets in the spring what would it cost to do a second round in the fall and are there uh targeted wards uh, that we potentially just want to target in the fall. If we have a heavy downpour in the fall, there could be a problem here. So it, it all came down to budget, but I think that's something we need to be cognizant of. So my question for staff, sorry, uh, that's uh, a lot of commentary as well, but what's what's the number one takeaway for the city of Ottawa following the August 10th rainstorm that we know significantly impacted five wards. If you could boil down what you took away from that and, and how you want to, to respond going forward, what's the number one takeaway from the city's perspective? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, this this is always, uh, I, I, I can answer this question different ways because the first answer I say is going to make it sound biased towards one thing versus another. But uh, the first thing that comes to mind the number one takeaway is it, it was already mentioned. Um, we know historically when we go to a public meeting and we show a map of where we have heard reported flooding, that we get somewhere between another 100% or double. Uh, and, and that's probably a low estimate because that's just the people that showed up. Um, and um, we, have, we have ever better information on flood risk and the performance of our system but this is is critical information and uh the struggle is that after a flood um especially after august 10th or i think we have all experienced this that's a difficult time to start asking people hey um can you give us this information you know where people are are hurting they're in distress there's there's a lot of um concern and anxiety and and that persists well after the storm uh, but we we've been uh, thinking through this uh, and we will be coming back in later this year with uh, our recommendations on how we could improve this system that for me that is is my number one takeaway um, it, it depending on what you're looking for we could answer other questions it's just that I you know I've been looking at and studying our systems for a long time so so where we have vulnerabilities or what type you know those are weren't the things that surprise me or, or take away it's it's just that there's much we we have to do things from a resident perspective see how they're interfacing with our programs or our requests for information and try to make that as easy as possible and and um not to mention that the residents are are not only asking us or we're not interfacing with residents but they're interfacing with your offices as well and and there's there's more we could do there excellent thank you and chair i'll just conclude by saying this a significant volume of water fell in a short period of time. And some people think, uh, you know, the city's infrastructure failed. And I think that's an unfair uh, conclusion. I, I don't think there was a global failure. But what I'm getting at is, to Councillor Devine's point is, we're going to have storms like this again in the future. So how do we mitigate, how do we learn from August 10th and mitigate going forward? We may not have infrastructure that can absorb such large volumes of water, but what can we do better and what can we all do to prepare in advance to mitigate impacts on homes, businesses, and other structures? So that's that's really at the end of the day what I'm looking for. Thank you. 
Any comments? Thanks, Councillor Brockington. Uh, Councillor King. Uh, thank you, Chair. And I just wanted to uh, really ask a question uh, based on uh, what staff had noted in terms of the need to raise general awareness about the issue of urban flooding generally, that there isn't uh, a deep understanding about uh, the roles and responsibilities of uh, the city, city infrastructure um, uh, residents. And I think we're we're hearing that as a clear theme um, in this debate, um, whether it was Councillor Kavanaugh, Carr, Devine, or Brockington talking about the need for greater communication with residents about their role um, the role of uh, mitigating uh, the the impacts of the floods, uh, the role of uh, of flood insurance, of having adequate flood insurance, and and examining that, uh, it's evident to me that uh, we need better communication products and tools to provide to residents that are very clear um, in terms of uh, the the requirements, especially uh, noting the impact. Uh, the increasing impact of climate change. So uh, just in, in terms of clarity, because I know that uh, Councillor Devine was asking about the usage of uh, social media, I'm just wondering what do uh, impactful and appropriate communication products look like uh, around uh, urban flooding? And uh, frankly, when uh, can councillors expect these types of communication products to to furnish to uh, their residents? Thank you for the question, uh, Chair. I I really believe it is it is the most important uh, topic that we're kind of working on right now because talking about urban flooding after a flood is not the appropriate time. We need to have that communication. We need to raise the awareness. We need people to understand what they can do before and what they can do during and what they can do after um, being impacted by these climate events that we're speaking of. Um, we are working with a lot of partners that we are not the only municipality. We're not the um, only group that is working on this type of communication. And we're trying to leverage a lot of, of those type of uh, communication tools. Um, we really do need a lot of different and multi-pronged tools and approaches. We have some very simplif uh, simplified one-pagers that we have just developed that we can show residents and it can show some of the things that they can do on a daily basis all the way to how some of our programs can help support them making incremental changes. I believe we also need to work with um, you know, insurance boards of Canada and, and understand what those insurance options are and make sure that residents are aware from, from our perspective, raise awareness of those type of products that they can look for as well. Um, so I, I don't know that there's one one uh, individual tool, but the continuous raising awareness. We've also discussed that, um, you know, prior to you having rain in, in the forecast, it, it could be as as easy as sending out a couple of tweets about, hey, complete keep, keep, uh, clear your gutters in preparation for the storm event or to the catch basin. Oh, and visit our website or visit this other tool that you can look at to try to continually reinforce the message and the preparedness for this particular topic, because we, we do believe it is something that residents um, do not think about on a on a frequent basis, and and that uh, is something that we we are looking forward to trying to to, to changing. Well, uh, I think all of us around this table appreciate that. Um, I think what we're hearing clearly is the need for uh, more communication tools uh, that provide uh, some level of clarity. Uh, to to residents about uh, the impacts of increasing uh, um, climate events. Um, I think it is necessary as well in um, established neighborhoods, uh, as, as had been noted in the report, uh, older neighborhoods that have not been designed to uh, modern uh, standards uh, will have uh, these these issues and there isn't going to be a quick fix so i think what's necessary is ensuring that residents know about the uh potential challenges that they might see uh with flooding i know um you know i experienced this um, in my role as counselor talking to uh residents in uh one of these one of the streets in the cummings community in, in my neighborhood in my ward uh, about the challenges that can can occur, that streets are, uh, you know, uh, flood infrastructure in a sense. Uh, but it was evident to me that the residents didn't actually understand uh, the uh, 
the challenges that uh, that really confront um, older uh, infrastructure in older neighborhoods. So I think that we need to do a better job at that. I think that we need to have uh, better communication tools uh, for that, uh, that uh, all uh, members of council can really utilize uh, to, to better inform their residents. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, uh, Councillor King. And similar to a lot of the other councillors speaking here today, and I'm going to go to you in a second, Councillor Devine, but, uh, you know, Heron Park had a huge amount of flooding. A lot of it was the high water table, but, but and it comes up through the, 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 the floor, right? It comes up through the, the drain. Uh, sewer backups, uh, we're getting uh, overland flooding, yes, but that can be dealt with. It's, it's, the, it's the water coming up from underneath and the sewer backups that we're seeing as particularly uh, an issue in, in my ward anyway. So um, I've really appreciated you know, your work uh, with residents, but they were literally knocking door to door um, when, when this happened after those floodings, they had, you know, huge, you know, garbage, um, containers outside their cause their, their basements were completely gone. Um, so uh, this is something that it's going to continue to exist in, in the urban suburban area. And I know there's rural flooding issues as well. Um, so it, it's something that, um, I, I know you're seized with the residential protective plumbing program right now with the $5,000 potential for, uh, installing some of these preventative, measures I think is good, but it's such, it could, you know, amount of residents that we have and the amount of that are at risk of flooding compared to what has actually been installed. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty low rain ready, Ottawa, another, you know, um, a great program uh, that needs to be made permanent. You know, th this is the type of thing that we, we have these programs in place, but they're not advertised a lot. There's not a lot of funding behind them. And we haven't been able to really, I guess, you know, get, get them out there um, across a bunch of communities that need them. So that's my concern is just expanding what we do really well and then communicating more for how people can access those programs. And I know, I know you're focused on that. With that, I'm going to pass it over to Councillor Devine uh, for your, your uh, second round. Uh, thank you, Chair, uh, for the indulgence of uh, getting back on. Um, so I just have two uh, two final questions. Um, going back to the city manager's quote where uh, the city manager referenced the city has a large role to play and we can do many things. And one thing that we can do is enforce certain measures to uh, prevent um um, flooding from happen. So I know that I've had in one one issue in my ward, and, and Tammy, we've spoken about this, is there are certain parts in my ward where the infill development or just single residents, what they do is they might alter their property um, in any number of ways. And I have one property that altered their property in three ways. They elevated their property, casting water runoff onto the adjacent lot. They um, got rid of all the grass and they made the entire front yard a driveway and therefore losing all the permeability. And just to add insult to injury, they filled in the backyard swale. And so a swale now just hits a wall, flooding over, um, um, affects the neighbors. And on any given basis, when any one parcel of land does that, they are cascading impacts on neighbors and therefore on the entire system. And the challenge I had in addressing this issue was I things that they should not. I assume we have regulations and bylaws in place that mandate what a property owner can and cannot do. And when I would raise these issues and I say, hey, I think I've caught a bad guy. I don't know what capacity we have to enforce that. I don't know what um, we have carrots, but I don't know what stick we have to make it clear to any resident that contemplates doing such a thing, let alone having done such a thing, that there will be a price to pay for having done such a thing. So I guess my question is whether it's how we communicate to residents not to do things to their property that will have negative impacts on their neighbors and therefore the system or residents who have already done so and may have to follow up and make changes. What tools do we have to clearly be able to enforce rules that I hope we have in place? Thank you, Mr. Chair, for the question. Uh, a lot of the issues that uh, uh, the councillor enumerated are actually found in the site alteration bylaw. So we do have uh, our partners with uh, planning, real estate, and economic development. Uh, it is uh, on a complaints basis. So as, as staff, as residents,
start it again. Okay, I got the thumbs up. Thank you. Um, so we'll get rolling again. We had um, Councillor Devine had asked a, a couple questions, and staff were in the middle of answering. I wanted to make sure the that I, I want to make I'll sure just the, start all over. <laughs> the public had the benefit of hearing. Um, maybe just to just get to the the question, <laughs> and then and then we'll get staff to respond. Basically, so I believe, I think, um, during last episode, I think you were um, you were about to list off, or you had begun listing off um, a series of um, ideas, initiatives, innovations the city has in place for generally increasing our resilience through absorbency, something to that effect. You were listing off a series of things. I think that's where we were. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Chair, and thank you for the reminder. Get me back up to speed. Yes, um, one of the things I believe I was mentioning was the retrofit uh, program. Uh, this is an existing program, but in the current or the upcoming infrastructure master plan, we will be recommending uh, expansion of that program to other urban water courses. Uh, that is tied really with uh in some ways with the rain ready ottawa program and and there'll be as you already heard there'll be something coming forward about uh, a report on recommendations for expansion i i mentioned a few times lid manual and i was kindly reminded that we use too much jargon <laughs> so we are talking about absorbent stormwater management techniques with this manual this is a manual to help provide guidance for our, our uh, staff in planning and development review on what to ask from developers for new development. Um, with the manual, it will provide us uh, additional guidance and clarity on, and and I, I, I hesitate to say standardization because it's not exactly standardization, but some clarity on how to apply these in other situations, non-development situations as well. And I, I think uh, you were mentioning um, uh, right away works. So th these are all things in in motion. And there was already a mention of the pr province, uh, an act coming up. That was also low impact development, which we could just call green or absorbent stormwater management. So there's a lot of things in play here. Um, there, I, oh, uh, the, uh, we were using the word absorbent. Um, going back to our presentation, just a reminder that that is one part of the spectrum of the entire stormwater drainage process and system. And it plays an important part. And in a lot of cases, it could play multiple parts, but it's, it's, uh, it's in my, in my mind, it, as a stormwater or drainage or water resources engineer, I, I look at that whole spectrum. And when we deal with flooding in extreme events or rainfall for small events, or if we look at water quality in streams, I, uh, this is a part of that spectrum, but it's not the only one. I sometimes historically, and I'm, I'm a little older perhaps, but uh, going back time in industry, the early conversations were it's either green or it's gray. And really the right, uh, the right way to think about it is what are the most effective tools we have in the toolkit and how to properly apply them and where, where it ends up being important. If we're putting infiltration techniques below the water table, they're not going to work. So just as, one example, but that's, that's not, we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. All of this is important. Thank you. And thank you, chair. Okay. Thanks very much for those questions. Great questions around the table. Um, and really appreciate staff's work on this. We look forward to the report coming back uh, to us just based on the discussions we've had. Um, this is a report for information. So can we receive that report for information? See you Perfect. Thanks so much. So uh, we are moving on now to, I believe it's the inquiries that were held uh, and lifted onto the agenda um, for this meeting. So the first inquiry is on the climate change uh, master plan. Let me just... Uh... Yes, so it's the climate change master plan and budget. Um, that inquiry was held by Councillor Hill. I think there may be a delegation uh, that's asked to speak as well. Okay, okay. So we've got one delegation that wants to speak on this issue. It's William Van Geest uh, from Ecology Ottawa. And then we'll get to, um, we'll turn over to Councillor Harrell after that and other Councillor members for, for questions. So you can come on down and speak to this if you'd like. We've already we voted. We did? Yeah.
All right, so you've got uh, five minutes for a delegation. Thanks very much, Chair. You can hear me okay, right? We can hear you well, and uh, you can go ahead. Great, thank you. Um, thanks very much, uh, Chair, uh, for the opportunity to address you today on behalf of Ecology Ottawa. Um, I appreciate this, particularly uh, given that the issue before us um, isn't a motion uh, itself. Um, so I requested to speak today in light of the importance of this issue that is spending on our climate change master plan. We at Ecology Ottawa uh, found staff's response to the inquiry on the 2023 CCMP spending not only informative, but encouraging. Last year was, of course, the first year funding was earmarked specifically for the CCMP's implementation, for which uh, the mayor and council should be applauded. And so it makes sense to review how we did. So how did we do? Admirably, I think, and I'll highlight a few points uh, in the response that we saw. First of all, the third party review of greenhouse gas inventories. Solid data, I'm sure you'll agree, is critical to making informed decisions. While this inventory is coming later than we want, it's still very welcome. Uh, pilot projects, like retrofitting the Hintonburg Community Center and the Wastewater Energy Transfer Pilot Project. Given that the funding earmarked for the CCMP in 2023, which is of course $5 million, is inadequate for the plan's full implementation, pilot projects make a lot of sense. They allow us to test approaches or technology to help us better spend funding when more becomes available whether through council's decision or of course from other levels of government. Another point, seeking and applying for funding uh, from other levels of government, of course, this amounts to increasing the overall funding available. And there's also district energy and community heating strategies. As we increasingly face extreme weather events like last year's tornadoes, uh, the flooding um, last August 10th that we were just talking about and the wildfire smoke that blanketed our city last summer, it's critical that our energy grid becomes more adaptable and resilient. Also residential and commercial building performance standards. As you know, buildings are the most significant source of GHG emissions in Ottawa, totaling around 45% of all emissions. Any progress to reduce these emissions is welcome. And given we've committed to building 151,000 new homes by 2031, regulations like the high performance development standards can't come soon enough. I trust this council will cease delaying the adoption of these standards. And last uh, item I'll mention is building, uh, building capacity. Uh, the climate team is converting one temporary position to a permanent, extending three temporary positions and hiring nine new temporary staff. This steady increase means greater effectiveness in implementing the CCMP. I'll stop there for now, but in short, the picture this document paints is of a strategic response to an evolving crisis. Somehow staff was able to divide $5 million among 26 different initiatives. This is not spreading their resources too thin as some have claimed. Instead, this is admirable thriftiness with a small allotment of funds and indicates that further investments would be well spent and would have significant impact. If the slices of pie are too small for some, the solution is to enlarge the pie as we uh, ourselves urged last November when budget 2024 was being considered. Of course, implementing the CCM, uh, CCMP's goals are more urgent than ever. If anything, the effects of climate change seem to be accelerating. February, uh, that is last month, was the hottest month ever recorded uh, over the 1.5 degree threshold in um, uh, the Paris Agreement. This past winter was the only one uh, so far in, in Ottawa where the temperature never dropped below minus 20 degrees. And Quebec's fire monitoring agency issued fire warnings last week, the earliest in its history. The need to take quick, decisive, and well-founded climate action to benefit all Ottawans is now. And this is what Ottawans want. Uh, 1,000 signed our petition uh, last summer for climate action. I trust this committee will continue to support staff's sensible spending of the modest $5 million they've been given to implement the CCMP over the remaining 20 months of its effective horizon. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your delegations. Uh, a delegation, I'm not seeing any questions at this time. Appreciate uh, you being here. Um, you. So we're now gonna go to uh, questions or comments from committee members for staff. Uh, Councillor Hill, you asked that this uh, be raised, so we'll go to you first. 
Uh, no, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you to staff for uh, for providing the response. Uh, uh, this is informative. I would agree with uh, with our delegate. Um, a number of kind of specific questions I have, and then we'll take it from there. Um, I will um, dwell on the comment that was made uh, by our delegate about the Hintonburg Community Centre. Uh, I note that there were $400,000 of retrofit funding spent in the 2023 plan, and it notes that we're using money to match uh, uh, federal funds. Could you confirm how much the federal government is spending on that project? We received about $630,000 from the federal government for that project. Um, so that would be approximately $1.3 million to retrofit the Hintonburg Community Centre. Um, how will that price tag compare to future retrofits of other community centres? Uh, is the Hintonburg representative of other community centres uh, in terms of features, size, uh, age, etc.? Thank you for the question, through you, Chair. We don't want to use the Hintonburg Community Centre as a way to extrapolate to other centres, but we are using it as a way to learn from the retrofit that we're doing there. In order for us to figure out what the costs for other retrofits will be for our, cor for our corporate portfolio, we're doing a net zero pathways study. We expect the results of that study to be, to be ready by the end of Q3 of this year. And that will give council options on how we can move towards net zero targets and what the costs for those different actions would be. Those will then be uh, considered in the asset management plans and long range financial plans. Uh, thank you. Um, and I appreciate the robust uh, key performance indicators for the project. Uh, can you speak to what we expect the total estimated energy savings or estimated GHG emission reductions for the project would be? Yeah, uh, the energy savings are expected to be about 64% annually. We anticipate a GHG savings of about 25 tons per year or about an 80% reduction for the facility. And that doesn't include uh, pending rooftop solar. No, that's appreciated. Um, I understand that we're changing the name for the waste energy transfer project to the sewer energy exchange system. Could you walk me through the reason for that name change and how does the new name match with uh, provincial or federal government or other uh, relevant regulation bodies to describe that technology? Thank you for the question. Uh, the reason that we're considering the name change is because there is a proprietary technology which is already described as wet. And so the name that we have started using is Sewage Energy Exchange System. And really, that's just to reflect an accurate use of the type of energy or where we're getting that energy from and to avoid any issues with the trademark language. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's good for now, Mr. Chair. Okay, thanks very much for those questions. Uh, Councillor Devine. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Andrea, for being here. Um, and uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Hill, for submitting this inquiry. Um, it was, uh, as the delegate William uh, Van Gies said, it was very, it was uh, exciting and and very re reassuring to see um, such a detailed and thorough response to that inquiry because it it gave me great confidence um, in how this um, this annual fund is being spent. Um, I was already supportive of the uh, the climate change um, master plan annual fund, but seeing such a detailed, comprehensive, strategic, and thorough um, explanation of what it is meant to do and the many areas um, it is attacking um, was was reassuring. I think comparatively, this this modest amount is is going to strategically advance not only some very, very tangible um, improvements like the Hindenburg retrofit, but I think what you are doing with this with this money, I, i'm I'm very, very confident that you are going to be advancing some very necessary strategic initiatives for pilots that are going to serve us in the long run. Um, um, I wish you well with this annual fund. I only desire to see it uh, sustained and improve. Um, thank you very much for providing those answers on the KPI indicators that Councillor Hill asked. The, the 65, I think you said 65% target of I hope I'm not misquoting you there. I think you said a 65% target of um, anticipated energy savings and uh, similarly high anticipated uh, GHD reductions. I wish you very well on that. Um, thank you for striving for greatness and um, thank you for the, uh, for the inquiry, Councillor Hill. Thank you very much, Councillor Devine. Councillor Brown. Thank you very much, Chair. Good morning, Andrea. 
Um, again, thank you to Councillor Hill for putting this inquiry forward and for the detailed response. Uh, obviously, a lot of staff time went into that. Um, I'm hoping you can walk me through how your group put their plans forward to management and then committee and council as to beef up the staff complement and then how that works into accomplishing the energy evolution plan and then the overall climate change master plan. And I guess from what I'm reading, and if I'm wrong, please correct me, but it looks like half of the uh, climate change budget is for staffing and consultants and, and communications and outreach. So how is that going to impact actually trying to accomplish our goals? Thank you for the question through you, Chair. The way that we developed the spending plan was using the prioritized list we've, made, we've been developing and maintaining over the last several years. As you know, this was the first time that we had a dedicated annual fund. And so, as you can imagine, there was a backlog from issues that had been, had been identified in previous years. We used the 2023 $5 million allocation to address a number of challenges that were identified in the 2023 Climate Change Master Plan progress report. Of those challenges, staff capacity was a significant barrier, and so a significant amount of funding has been used to build capacity not only within the climate change and resiliency team, but also within other teams in the asset management uh, team, the urban forest team, and the forest health team. So we've, we're trying to build capacity within the organization because we recognize that the responsibility and accountabilities are distributed throughout the organization. You also raised the issue of studies. There were a number of questions, uh, such as the one related uh, from Councillor Hill around how are we going to do municipal retrofits on a portfolio scale, for instance. That's one of the studies that's being included in that 2023 spending plan, as is an electricity capacity assessment to better understand what our facilities have in terms of capacity and where future loads may have impact. Thank you very much. I guess I just want to make sure that we're not staffing up and then leaving the pot bare so we can't actually go out and accomplish some of our goals. So I appreciate you taking the time to come out. Again, very detailed response and looking forward to the work that's going to come out of your team over the next year. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hill. Uh, sorry, uh, Councillor Brown. Uh, Councillor Curry is up next. And then I got Councillor Hill on the list again. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for this. Glad to see this list so that we could actually see what uh, is being spent and how. Um, one of the questions I have is for each of these, is there already uh, prepared outcomes? So not just KPIs, but outcomes so that at the end of after spending this money, we would see an outcome that could be reported on to council? I'd have to go back to the list, at, uh, list as a whole to answer that question. Uh, I mean, perhaps as a more general answer, I'll say any of the studies that are being done through the uh, spending plan, the results will be used to inform future work, and those will require council uh, direction or decision in order to implement. Um, for staff, they remain temporary until any council decision or direction is made to change that. And for the pilots, they would the results of the pilots would come back as part of any future work to inform larger projects or portfolio uh, type projects. Okay, I, yeah, maybe I, sorry, I wasn't clear, but I'm talking about like climate outcomes, like some of our our outcomes in terms of helping the environment, helping greenhouse gas emission reduction. Are there any outcomes that are expected from the money that will be spent? Yes, as projects are developed and uh, approved by council, the KPIs and the outcomes are identified as part of that process. And then as part of our annual progress report, we report back on what kind of outcomes we have achieved through those projects or programs based on the resources that have been allocated. Okay, I guess I will look forward to that. One of the questions I would ask as well, um, in any of these, do you see any revenue generation opportunities for the city? There are some revenue generation opportunities to be explored. I think it's too early to say that they could be confirmed. Things like the sewer energy exchange system will make a modest, uh, it what represents a modest income potential, though at this point we're looking primarily at cost recovery. Projects related to district energy and renewable natural gas generation also have some revenue generation potential, but again, additional work is required in order to assess that. Okay. Um, 
in terms of the deep building retrofit, I know you just have Hindenburg on there, but can you talk to me about how much, um, even just the other one, the electrical capacity assessment, how much work will be done by Hydro Ottawa for these? We are working closely with Hydro Ottawa on a number of the initiatives. Uh, certainly for the electrical capacity assessment, we are using data from Hydro Ottawa. The study itself will look at what the capacity for almost 120 facilities is, and we'll look at future loads for those facilities, whether it's EV charging, battery charging for small equipment, uh, ice reservicers, et cetera, um, converting heat options to things like heat pumps. We'll look at the new loads, and then there's a larger conversation that will be part of that net zero municipal building pathway around how much we're shifting towards net zero buildings and Hydro Ottawa will be part of those conversations. Other projects like the ZVIP applications would be developed with consultation with Hydro Ottawa and we're in preliminary discussions with Hydro Ottawa on community heat and district energy. Okay, so just to, for me to be quite specific, at our at our uh, program and services review committee, Hydro Ottawa came in and talked to us about how they could actually do our deep building retrofits, and and it would not be at a cost to the city, and it would be very similar to the award winning uh, street light conversion project. So I'm just wondering, has that started? I don't have the most recent information on that, but we could get back to you. All right, because uh, that was one of the things, you know, I, my understanding was the LED conversion was something the city was not that uh, keen to do originally and then determined, oh, wow, this is actually a great idea and came from Hydro Ottawa's uh, urging. Um, this one, the deep building retrofit seems to be a similar one where I think Hydro Ottawa has been asking for a number of years to go down this road and the city has been reluctant. So I would just say... Um, given what they continually repeat to us at our service and program review working group meetings, uh, that they're willing to be the entity that does them. I would really like to see a report back on that. Uh, and some of the other reports that you've indicated will come to us. Can you just give me a, an idea of when we would get some of this information? There's a number of different studies that have been identified. Let me just pull up the list here. Um, the electrical... Uh, capacity assessment is expected at the end of 2023. The uh, uh, study for assessing the feasibility of net zero municipal buildings is expected as also at the end of 2023. The third party review of our GHG inventories, the preliminary results are expected at the end of this month. Um, those are a couple of top, top of mind, Councillor. If there's anything specific that you had a question about, I'd be happy to look at those as well. Okay, sorry, just the end of 2023. So we're already into 2024. So just so I'm clear, are they already out? My my apologies, end of Q3 2024. Sorry, sorry about that, Councillor. Oh, okay, okay. They're, okay. they're not finished. No, none of the studies that are listed are finished at this point. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, uh, Councillor Cree. Uh, Councillor Hill on your second round. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a follow up uh, from Councillor Brown's comment about the uh, the volume of uh, investment from this packet that's uh, going towards uh, contracting and staff. Uh, do we have the necessary safeguards and policies in place in the terms and conditions that we uh, create with service providers to ensure that we prevent either the perception of or actual conflict of interest? Thank you for the question, sir. Uh, through our procurement policies, I believe that we would address those, but I could take that away and double check unless uh, we've got someone from legal that wants to add anything additional to that. No, I'm seeing no. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, in the report, we mentioned the emission performance bylaws twice. Uh, with the development of these bylaws requiring nearly $400,000 in spending. Uh, could you speak, please, to what those bylaws would potentially be and who in Ottawa would be impacted by those bylaws? The bylaws is part of the better building strategy that was approved by Council. It's one of the last steps in the strategy. It starts with uh, benchmarking. That was the one of the programs that was uh, recognized this morning as part of the environmental awards. First, it's asking buildings to disclose voluntarily what their en energy and emissions are for buildings. Then we have a series of supports to help building owners and operators through education and outreach. 
Uh, some of the work that is in the spending plan speaks to that. It also speaks to workforce development because really we're, we're working towards market transformation in this. Over time, over a long period of time, building performance standards have been shown to be the most cost-effective and efficient way to reduce emissions and energy in buildings, private sector buildings. And if we follow the trajectory of other municipalities, such as Vancouver, Montreal, or Toronto, they tend to have long lead times, five years or so, between when councils consider the development of, of building performance standards and when they start to be implemented. We'd be looking at large buildings over um, 100,000 square feet to start, then phasing down to 50,000 square feet and perhaps going as low as 10,000. Again, these are all in uh, very long timelines and have not yet been considered by council. I appreciate that. Uh, do you have a timeline on when you would expect that that would come to council? Not the standards themselves. We're doing the study right now, which is identified in that spending plan to understand what the uh, current energy and emissions uh, profiles are for a range of building archetypes in Ottawa. We're also doing costing studies to try and understand what the impacts are to achieve uh, the energy and emission standards and to figure out what the right thresholds would be. So we would first bring a report on benchmarking and mandatory benchmarking we don't have a timeline for uh, building performance standards at this stage. Okay, and when you refer to them as performance standards, you what you're are you are you you're suggesting that this is a mandatory bylaw across the city, or if we follow the the uh, trajectory of other municipalities, they first do a voluntary benchmarking program, then a mandatory benchmarking program, then a long timeline in order to. Uh, prepare the market for mandatory standards, and then those mandatory standards are enacted through a bylaw. Okay, no, I appreciate the time on this. Thank you very much, Andrea. Okay, uh, I'm gonna go to Councillor Luloff, who hasn't spoken yet, and then back to Councillor Curry on your second round. Sure, thanks, Chair. Um, when we're working on our emissions inventory, are we looking at gross estimated or net estimated, You know, given the amount of green space in Ottawa, our significant rural tree canopy, our incredible efforts to plant more trees. I think uh, it was two to one on the LRT corridor, which I think is absolutely incredible. Um, and uh, the greening of our fleet, all of these extra efforts that we've gone through. Um, are we are we looking at uh, net uh, estimated emissions or gross estimated emissions? We're looking at gross estimated emissions. Uh, the third party inventory reviews will look at both our corporate emissions and our community emissions. They use real data sources uh, as opposed to projections. One of the other priorities of the climate change master plan speaks to carbon sequestration. And that's where we start to look at absorbing of carbon through things like wetlands, through trees, et cetera. Part of our third party review is looking at pre the preliminary, kind of the high level back of the envelope envelope potential based on the green space that we have allocated, but more detailed analysis will be required in order to do the net um, GHG emissions that you're asking about. Okay, wonderful. When can we expect uh, that information? Is this going to come at the same time? Uh, the third party review will have the preliminary results at the end of this month. I do expect that there will be a significant amount of internal discussion because we draw on other departments for the data and because we want to make sure that we've understood and that the third party consultant has understood how the city is collecting data and reporting on it. The carbon sequestration piece, I don't have a timeline for. We don't we don't know what the next steps of that are until we see the preliminary results of the uh, third party review. Okay, given the, that there's m much of the green space in Ottawa is um, is owned and maintained uh, by other orders of government, are we going to be working with them on that carbon sequestration piece as well? I'm sure that they have inventories as well that we'll be able to draw that sort of data from. Thank you for the question. Uh, we are working with other low levels of government on aspects of that, such as the uh, green space. We're also working with them on, uh, exp we're exploring right now what the renewable energy generation potential might be with other levels of government because of the significant federal lands in the area. But there's no, uh, there's no memorandums of understanding or formal agreements in place yet to work together. We're still in the exploratory phase. 
Okay, great. I just want to make sure that we have a, a clear picture at the end of this um, so that uh, we know um, what our benchmark is and what we can what we can work towards. Thanks. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, Councillor Curry. Thank you. Sorry, I just didn't realize I'd had one more question here. Uh, the items that are moving temporary staffing to permanent staffing, can you just tell me a little bit about why that would be necessary instead of keeping them temporary? Council approved as part of budget 2024, the conversion of three temporary staff to permanent staff because they were long, long-term staff. One of those staff focuses on education and outreach. And as we've heard many times today, there's a significant aspect of education and outreach that deals not only with the climate change file, but supports the work of colleagues and other departments as they themselves are bringing other work forward. One of the other positions is to focus on electric vehicles. As we know, there's a significant growth with electric vehicles and there had not been any dedicated uh, expertise within the corporation on electric vehicles or electric vehicle charging. And as the city explores the options for the installation of electric vehicle charging, having that expertise in-house has been uh, very useful. And then finally, the last position is to, is to support building retrofits. And we anticipate that there's a significant amount of work both within the corporation and within the community at large to support building retrofits. Yeah, I, I understand the important work. I just, why ha, why do they have to be permanent instead of temporary? Thank you for the question. Uh, through, you, through you, Chair, we've had a difficult time attracting and retaining staff uh, with this set of expertise. As you know, it's a competitive market given how quickly things are evolving. Uh, there's a competitive market with the private sector, the utility sector, and the public sector because these areas are growing so fast. Part of converting these positions to permanent positions was to recognize that there's a long-term um, opportunity and benefit. And in order to staff that with the appropriate um, expertise, we felt it was useful to convert those to permanent positions. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Councillor, uh, for your questions. I'll just make a couple comments on this. I think like many city departments, uh, most of it is staffing costs. You see our city budget, the vast majority of that budget is staffing costs, just like uh, we have staffing costs for, for this team. Um, but I think the, the thing that I want to, I guess, accentuate to, to members um, is that the climate team has done, done a very good job of leveraging funding with a limited budget. So, I'll just give you a, a couple examples. Um, they leveraged $23 million in private investment for $3 million, just $3 million in loans distributed through the Better Homes loan program. So there's a huge amount of money that comes in just for this small amount that we put into this, this team. Um, they helped to successfully apply for the $350 million grant from Infrastructure Canada. Um, we heard just today they applied for and received the 629,000 from Infra Infrastructure Canada to help cover the eligible expenses for that retrofit to Hindenburg Community Center. So I think we're getting a lot of bang for our buck for what we're putting into this very small team. We're obviously scrutinizing today on, and I think every department needs to be scrutinized appropriately, but my goodness, are we ever getting a lot back for the work of these employees? So thank you for all you've done and the dedication that you've shown to this city and what's a relatively new area, but obviously a needed area, given all the challenges that we're going to face in the future. When it comes to climate, you save this city a lot of money, you bring a lot of money into the city, and you mitigate the effects of climate change at the same time. So thank you for all of your work. Appreciate folks' questions today uh, on this item. We're going to move on now to the next item, which is been held, and that's the solid waste uh, of the landfill item. So uh, I know staff are here to answer questions there. At Council Hill, I believe you held this item. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the reason that I asked the inquiry in the first place was to get an appreciation for uh, global landfill capacity across the city. Uh, I understand uh, from the numerous briefings that we've had, the concern that we have about the uh, capacity at trail landfill. Uh, we've heard on numerous occasions uh, that uh, we have a concern and that uh, that landfill is uh, is getting used up and that we have, you know, around 12 to 13 ish years of, uh, of life expectancy at that landfill. And then we need to uh, be transitioning to something else, be it another landfill, be it uh, some technology or what have you. And we're in the process of having that conversation. 
And really what I'm, what I'm getting at with this inquiry and what I really want to understand is how we are maximizing the total uh, landfill capacity in, in the Ottawa area so that we can have the most breathing room possible uh, when it comes to our, our trail landfill resource. Um, now, I know that we are entering into some agreements uh, over the next few years whereby we're going to be leveraging uh, some of the private landfills in our area. And really the question that I have is, are we maximizing the capacity that we can leverage those landfills uh, in order to squeeze every uh, usable year out of the trail landfill um, and you know, buy us as much time as, as will be necessary for us to make the next step into whatever the next phase of, uh, of, of life after trail is? So that's, that's my question. Good morning. Thank you for the question. Um, so I, I'm glad that you referenced the, the curbside collection contract. So through that work, uh, committee and council approved uh, allocating 30,000 tons to the west and 30,000 tons to the east uh, in order to leverage the our existing facility as well as leveraging the, the facilities that are, that are currently in our community. Uh, this current year, we're undertaking a, a lot of change. Uh, we're also... Um, completing or or we we've begun um an on-street audit in order to understand better what the allocation, so when residents are putting out their waste, are we seeing an increase in the use of recycling and an increase in organics? With that insight, we will have better measures to then update our long-term planning requirements, uh, recognizing that our estimate for the 30,000 was based on uh, data originally from 2018, 2019, as, as well as projections. So we'll be looking to update that. With that, we'll also be reviewing what is actually on the street in order to see whether or not there are opportunities for us to further leverage. So when we did that initial assessment of the 30,000 in the east and the west, it was based on data that we had collected of the um, our existing curbside contractors who are collecting waste in those areas and where we felt it was beneficial to, to leverage those facilities. So over the next year, we can be further refining that. And if there are opportunities in order to increase that amount, we can bring that back to committee and council for a recommendation. So very much it was a starting point. I think it positions us appropriately in order to leverage those facilities, as you do say, that are in our, are in our community, uh, but always being mindful of, of the financial and environmental pieces as well. So welcome that opportunity to bring back information as we update those numbers. Uh, thank you, Shelley. That's my question, Mr. Chair. Thanks very much, uh, Councillor. Thank you for being here, Shelley, and staying with us today. Okay, I think that's it for our agenda. Um, it's been a good meeting. I don't think there's any in-camera items. Uh, there we have two information previously distributed items that are on the agenda. Um, are there any notices of motion for next meeting? Okay, uh, seeing none. Any inquiries? Okay, not seeing any. Um, all right, we're adjourned. So the next meeting will be April 6, 2024. Looking forward to seeing everyone there. Thanks, everybody.